Hi, this is Nilton from craftofprogramming.com and today we're going to uh, talk about unit testing. So I've got here in the board a uh, map of the topics that we are going to cover in this uh, lesson and uh, we're going to be defining what a unit test is, uh, what are the properties or features of uh, good unit tests, uh, what are the types of unit tests that um, you are going to implement, as well as the mechanics of uh, how unit tests are implemented. So let's start with the very basic question of what a unit test is. So unit test is essentially a small piece of code that applies an input onto a component and then asserts or verifies uh, you know, the expectations that you set. So typically a component is uh, referred to as a CUT or component under test. And essentially what you do is you have this component under test, which is essentially at the level of, of granularity of uh, unit test is a class or a very small group of classes, which are very you know, uh, related to each other. And you, this system, uh, you apply an input and then this input moves this um, class on from state Y to state, uh, you know, Z and it produces an output. And essentially what you do with your, um, with a unit test is you assert that this system uh, is on state uh, Z. So that's, uh, that's essentially what you do. Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, the properties of good unit tests is they need to run fast. And fast typically means, you know, milliseconds. Now, why is, this, why is it important that unit tests need to run fast? Well, primarily because of, uh, you know, um, scale. So on a realistic code base, typically, you will find that there are tens of thousands or more of unit tests that are run. Uh, and these usually are, um, uh, you know, run um, on, um, you know, basically triggered by a um, commit on a, um, on say master branch or develop branch. And every time you do that, you know, the build kicks off and as part of your build, you run all your tests. So it's important that these tests run fast so that your all overall, you know, test suite to tens of thousands of tests run, uh, you know, fast. Another the reason why unit tests need to run fast is because of you want to have quick feedback loops while you are implementing code. So if your tests run slow, then what you're gonna you're not gonna be compelled to use them while you are coding. You want to have quick feedback loops where you implement something and then you run your tests typically to make sure that you know if you are adding a new feature that you're not breaking any existing tests. So it's important that you have this quick feedback loop that gives you confidence that you're not breaking anything as you are developing a feature. Uh, so again, uh, tests that uh, run fast, you're gonna be encouraged to run them often as you develop uh, you know, features. So another good property of unit tests is that they need to be small and focused, right? Um, so uh, typically a test uh, is a method and they should test only one sim single piece of, uh, of production code logic. Uh, and one good uh, heuristics to check that tests are small and focused is that they should not have any control, um, you know, flow statements like ifs or elses or whiles or loops. If you start seeing, the, if you start seeing the need to implement these in your single test methods, then you know this is a sign of um, bad practice. It's a smell, and at that point you need to be thinking about. Uh, breaking, you know, this uh, method into multiple individual tests. Another uh, good property of unit tests is trustworthy. And what I mean by trustworthy is that the, the developers in, uh, in your team need to trust the tests. And um, one metrics for that is that tests should not produce false positives nor false negatives. Now, false positive is essentially um, a test that basically f um, has an assertion failure for something that, for production code that is working. 
uh, and uh, this assertion failure is a problem of the test, not of the production code. Conversely, a false negative is when a test fails to detect an actual bug on production code. So as you can imagine, either of these things are bad for, uh, you know, for a test or a test suite. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, when, if this starts happening with, with frequency, then what's going to happen is people start, you know, lose trust in the, on the tests and then, you know, they will probably just, you know, add the infamous at ignore uh, annotation to the test and because they just don't trust them. Um, another important thing to a test is readability, which is closely related to maintainability of a test. And essentially here, what uh, you should really pay attention to is observe good object-oriented practices when writing tests. So all of the good uh, object-oriented practices, you know, and idioms that you apply when writing good object-oriented code in production, you should observe them while writing unit tests, because after all, unit tests are, you know, source code. Uh, and just like production code, unit tests evolve and change over time. So the production code that the unit tests are uh, uh, testing evolves and changes, and so does the so does the unit test. So it's important that unit tests are readable and maintainable. <clears throat> so don't forget that um, these things last for a long time. The original developer may have left the team. So it's important that any new developer that looks at a test understands it quickly what it does and it's able to extend it um, or, or to make changes to it. Another important feature of unit tests is automation. So um, for that, it's, uh, so automation here is basically two levels. One is at the level of IDE while you are working locally. And obviously any modern IDE like IntelliJ um, IDEA for which I have, uh, you know, a, uh, I'm going to put here a link to the IntelliJ IDEA tutorial that I've, um, I have a course on that. Um, so any modern IDE, be it IntelliJ IDEA or um, Eclipse or NetBeans, they have full uh, support to, you know, to run unit tests. And uh, automation is also at the level of continuous integration systems um, like TeamCity or Jenkins. And here uh, it's important that um, the unit tests are integrated with your builds so that every time you do a commit, it triggers a build and your tests are run. And the support for all of these is obviously through frameworks. Um, so another thing that I'd like to cover is types of unit tests. Uh, so basically they are split into state-based tests and um, interaction-based tests. And what are the difference between these two? Well, state-based tests, you can think of them as results-driven tests or black box tests. This is typically what you test in, um, you know, the n-unit family of tests, be it, for example, j-unit. Uh, and that's basically what, what this is, right? You apply an input onto the system or the component under test, and at the end, you assert that the component has moved from state y to state z as a result of your input. So you don't care how it got to that state, that's why it's result-driven test. So this is basically state-based test, uh, and that's you know, what JUnit typically supports. Conversely, an interaction-based test, some people call it action-driven test, and I'll, you know, it's, think of it as a white uh, box test. And typically, what you are interested here is, uh, you know, you have your object here, and this object basically um, exchanges messages with its collaborate, collaborators, like say, you know, object Y sends a message to object Y, this guy sends a message to object X, it sends a message, so let's say message F, and then you get another message, uh, you know, um, G, there is another uh, message here from another object, Z, that sends a message to this, H, so, essentially what you are testing here is the interaction or the exchange of messages 
from your object with its uh, collaborators like object Y here, object X, object Z. So you know, that's why I call it you know, a white box test. You are actually checking the, what messages were uh, exchanged between your, the object under test with its collab collaborators. Um, and this typically you can go to the level of which parameter actually got, uh, you know, um, was transmitted with that message. You can make assertions at that level. Uh, and this typically is um, supported by, you know, mocking frameworks. For example, Mockito or EasyMock in the, or TestNG in the Java uh, ecosystem. But for, um, you know, JUnit, JUnit is really focused on state-based test or results-driven test. So now we've covered uh, what the unit tests are, properties of good unit tests, as well as types of unit tests. Now, how do you go about, you know, um, implementing these? What is the support that you have for, um, for unit tests in, um, in the Java world? So this is basically done, obviously, with JUnit, uh, you know, uh, framework. So um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, for this course, we're going to focus on JUnit 4 and JUnit 5. I will start with um, covering JUnit 4, even though JUnit 5, as of March 2019, when I'm recording this, is already released. But the reason why I want to cover JUnit 4 as well is because there is a lot of code base out there that is using JUnit 4. So, you know, the odds that you are going to join a project that is using JUnit 4 is just too high. So it's important to be familiar with JUnit 4 um, and obviously we're going to cover, you know, the new features of JUnit 5 as well. So what I have here is the mechanic or the anatomy of a, you know, uh, JUnit uh, test. So essentially the tests are, um, you know, uh, marked or tagged with a um, run with. So that's the basic JUnit uh, runner. And the class under test itself typically has a before class annotation, an after class annotation, and then before, after, and test. So the before class annotation is applied to a public static uh, void method. And this is run once when the class is loaded. So you load the class under test and this uh, method is run. Conversely, the after class annotation is applied, must be applied to a public static void uh, method. The name of the methods incidentally don't really matter. What matters is that the, the um, the modifiers, the, need, uh, the before class annotation needs to be applied to public static void method as well as the after class annotations. But like I, I was saying, the before class is applied to a method that is um, executed only once when the class is loaded and the after class annotation is applied to a method that is um, um, invoked after all of the tests in a um, a class under test are, have, uh, are run, including the teardown method. Um, so before class and after class, you would use them to do, you know, a static initialization of state that you would need uh, before all the tests uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a class under test and for the after class, all of the cleanup that you'd need to do once. Before and after annotations are applied to instance methods, pub public void instance methods. Again, the name don't really matter. By convention uh, and by histor for historical reasons, they are called setup and teardown respectively. And these two methods are called um, before and after each of the test methods respectively. So a test method is uh, tagged with the test um, annotation and again a test method needs to be a public void uh, method again the name doesn't really matter and before each of the methods the test methods which are um, annotated with the test annotation are run the method uh, setup is run and then after the test method successfully finishes the uh, method teardown which is annotated with the after annotation is run 
So um, actually that reminds me of one important thing that I did mention here of good properties. Uh, another good characteristic of a test is that um, they should be isolated. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the uh, state that um, uh, basically uh, the, the initial, the state after a test terminates needs to be, uh, you know, the same as the state uh, before the test terminates. Um, so obviously if a test, a test typically modifies the state, so you need to make sure that the state is restored to the state before the test ran. And this is what you would do with the before and after methods. So there should not be any dependencies on the order, for example, that you execute tests. This is a sign of that the tests are not isolated, that there are de interdependencies between the tests. So uh, to fix that, you need to make sure that, the, like I said, after a test finishes, it needs to restore the state to the way it was before. And this is how, why you'd use the before and after uh, methods. So um, I think that's pretty much it as a, an overview of uh, what we are going to be covering. Um, so we're going to be now, now that we have this good conceptual framework of um, you know, what a unit test is, uh, what are the properties of good unit tests, what are the types of unit tests and how they are implemented or supported uh, you know, in, in the, by frameworks. Now we are in a good uh, you know, position to dive in into code and actually get into the details, implementation details um, uh, you know, of JUnit. So we're going to go through uh, an example um, you know, as realistic as possible. And we're going to be covering all of the features of JUnit 4 as well as JUnit 5. Thanks for watching.